Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining Ian and I today on our webinar, Client Decisional Capacity and a Legal Retainer. As a reminder, Ian and I have about 15 minutes or so at the end for questions. Uh, I understand that you enter them into your chat box and we can take it from there. So let's get started. A client's capacity, vulnerability, susceptibility to undue influence should be an ever-present consideration for all lawyers, not just estates or trust lawyers or even elder law lawyers. Lawyers are obligated to ensure in any retainer that clients have the requisite capacity to give instructions, to retain counsel, to execute documents, to resolve their matter. The, the next slide indicates uh, just what we're going to go through today in terms of a lawyer's obligation, the grounds upon which a lawyer's conduct will be reviewed or examined, how to reconcile the legislative and common law precedent, as well as the legal ability, abilities and limitations of attorneys and guardians in their substitute decision making. To give you an overview of why decisional capacity and the lawyer's role is more important than it ever was before, we'll try to contextualize the current demographics. So, our population is aging rapidly. Globally, we're facing the largest demographic shift in humankind's history, and the statistics on aging are staggering. In 2017, there were an estimated 962 million people aged 60 or over in the world, and that number is growing at about a rate of 3% per year. The number of persons aged 80 or over globally is projected to triple by 2050, from 137 million to 425 million. It's predicted by 2036 that there will be 11 million seniors in Canada, and 15% of our population is already over the age of 65. For men, life expectancy is now at an all-time high in Canada of 86 years old, and for women, they can expect to live till age 89. Well, it's certainly not the case that all older adults have mental capacity challenges. With longevity comes an increased potential of medical issues, which potentially affect cognition. And there are related diseases and disorders that can affect capacity and increase an individual's susceptibility to being vulnerable or dependent. In 2010, an estimated 36 million people worldwide were living with dementia, and this number is expected to double in 20 years. Dementia in general is a term used to describe symptoms associated with cognitive decline or poor mental function, um, severe enough to affect a person's ability to perform everyday uh, activities. It's caused by a variety of diseases and disorders and injuries that affect the brain, Alzheimer's disease being the most common. According to the U.S. Alzheimer's Society, worldwide there's a newly reported case every 69 seconds. In the U.S., Alzheimer's is the sixth leading cause of death with no cure. One in 11 Canadians over the age of 65 currently has Alzheimer's or related dementia. In Canada, dementia affects 20% of older adults by the age of 80 and well over 40% by the age of 90. Normal aging and, for example, depression, often untreated or undiagnosed, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, psychotic disorders, Delusions, debilitating illnesses, senility, drug and alcohol abuse, and addiction can affect capacity and increase vulnerability. It's an understatement to suggest that issues of capacity are complex. Issues of capacity arise for all lawyers, and this will only increase in frequency as our population increases and ages. Capacity is defined or determined upon mixed factors of law and fact, and by applying the evidence to the available uh, or applicable test for capacity. Notably, there is no test. It's, uh, we refer to it as a test, but really it's factors or um, uh, a standard that is applied through uh, case law or through statute, statute to ascertain what the requisite capacity is to do a certain task or to make a certain decision. There's no single legal definition of capacity. Each task has its own uh, corresponding capacity criteria. And it's important to remember that all persons are deemed to be capable at law. A person is not globally capable or incapable. Rather, capacity is determined on a case-by-case -case basis in relation to a particular decision or task 
and at a moment in time. Capacity is decision specific, it's time specific, and capacity can fluctuate, so it's situation specific. Capacity is decision specific in that each test <clears throat> or each task or decision has its own specific capacity criteria. A different analysis is required for determining the requisite capacity to do, for example, a continuing power of attorney for property, or <clears throat> still different to grant a, a, sorry, a power of attorney for personal care. The capacity to execute a will is different than the determination for the requisite capacity to marry and to, for example, make inter vivos gifts. Capacity is time specific since legal capacity can fluctuate and the law permits for good days and bad days. Simple examples would include an otherwise capable person may lack capacity under the influence of alcohol at a point in time, but <clears throat> when not under the influence of alcohol, uh, present as capable. Any expert capacity assessment or examination of capacity must state the date and time of the assessment. Capacity is also situation specific. So under different situations, for example, one of stress, uh, a client may present capable, for example, at home, but not at their lawyer's office or their doctor's office. Generally, the ability to understand and process information is the key to capacity. The ability to understand the relevant information requires the cognitive ability to process, to retain, to understand, and then to apply that information to the circumstances and make a, a decision knowing the foreseeable risks and benefits of a decision. And we know that from the case of Stars and Swayze. So capacity is assessed both on legal factors and medical factors. Assessments are completed by different people with different expertise, for example, by, <clears throat> by doctors or social workers, and sometimes by a lawyer. The assessment of capacity is a less than perfect science in contentious settings, such as in estate litigation, capacity is frequently evaluated retrospectively. So long after the person perhaps had an assessment or um, is since deceased. It's important to note that some forms of capacity are governed by legislation, such as the Substitute Decisions Act. And from now on, I'll say SDA when referring to the Substitute Decisions Act. So, for example, the capacity to manage property, to grant a power of attorney for personal care, to grant a power of attorney for property. But other assessments have evolved through common law precedent, through case law over time, for example, testamentary capacity and the capacity to marry. Overall, we must keep in mind the serious ramifications of a capacity assessment because potentially we are taking rights away. We are interfering with the autonomy of a person. It's a fine balancing act that a lawyer has to perform when, when trying to protect a person and their rights and try to, to do the job that the uh, client has come to us for. So an overview of the relevant statutes, we have the SDA, the Mental Health Act, the Healthcare Consent Act. The SDA uh, provides the statutory criteria for um, determining the requisite capacity to manage property and to make personal care decision. It also provides the framework for granting powers of attorney for guardianship uh, and statutory guardianship. And it also provides um, the section three rules. So the SDA creates a special type of retainer between a lawyer and a client where the client's capacity is at issue. Uh, a lawyer in these cases is appointed under section three of the SDA and is referred to as section three counsel. And while the, the counsel have all the regular duties of a, a lawyer, there is a, a, a special uh, retainer between them. And so the court orders the retention of the counsel and um, often uh, the, the duties that the Section 3 counsel uh, role is to fulfill. So um, that role is to determine capable instructions, capable wishes, um, and it means that the lawyer acting as Section 3 counsel um, can fulfill their role, uh, but knows that there's a strong probability that the client has some sort of cognitive impairment that may make it difficult to obtain instructions. 
So Section 3 counsel has to take care to provide instructions or wishes of the client only to the extent that they can obtain those and not substitute their own opinion or their own view of, the, of what is in the best interests of the person. And recently we've seen an expansion um, of the role of Section 3 counsel and some of the court orders that are coming out where they're designating um, the Section 3 counsel, for example, and I don't know if you've seen this, Ian, um, the role of, uh, for example, reviewing all of the medical notes and solicitor's notes and um, financial uh, notes to provide a report to the court, which I think is expanded. It wasn't, it's not really spoken of in the historical cases. It's not referred to in the statute, but I think it's consistent with the role of assisting the court. Have you seen? Yeah, I see it growing, and I think it's partly because we're struggling with it. The language isn't, it's, it's pretty broad in terms of the appointment, and uh, we're struggling with it because the courts are looking to us to give them guidance, and, uh, and so it's an informed guidance when you get a chance to go through the records. So, I mean, it makes it consistent with the, uh, the goals of this section. And I think it's really important, though, when you, at least if I were acting as Section 3 counsel, I would want to have it definitively set out in the order what my role was, because I know that in, in recent years there's been a slew of negligence claims against Section 3 counsel, and um, I think it, it's important to make sure the role is crystal clear if it's a role that is, is an expanded role. Yeah, I mean, it ties to setting up the nature of the retainer. It's sort of an opportunity. We're going to talk about that a little bit when we have clients that are in that gray zone of capacity, how we create retainers. Well, the Section 3 Council, you can tighten up your role just by informing the court of the kind of parameters you expect to be given. Yeah. Okay, so just briefly, the Mental Health Act legislates criteria for voluntary uh, informal or involuntary admissions to specifically designated psychiatric facilities. Um, it requires an assessment uh, to manage property following admission to a psychiatric facility. And the statute protects the rights of patients requiring um, rights of advice, for example, uh, once a, a, an assessment has been performed, and the right for the person to uh, go to the Consent Capacity Board, which is a tribunal, to review the finding of incapacity. And the other relevant legislation is the Health Care Consent Act, and it codifies the common law requirement that health care practitioners obtain capable, informed, and voluntary consent prior to pr proceeding with, for instance, treatment or treatment decisions, um, uh, which would include, for example, uh, admission to a long-term care facility. And importantly, the Health Care Consent Act provides for patients who wish to challenge the finding of incapacity again to that tribunal, the Consent Capacity Board, which I'll refer to as the CCB. So what is the CCB? The CCB is an independent provincial tribunal. It has been established to provide a fair and accessible adjudication of consent and capacity issues and balancing the rights of the vulnerable and um, individuals with public safety. Uh, it holds hearings under the, all of this legislation, the Healthcare Consent Act, the Mental Health Act, and the Substitute Decisions Act, as well as the Personal Health Information Protection Act and the Mandatory Blood Testing Act. Parties to these hearings have a right of appeal. They appeal to the Superior, Ontario Superior Court of Justice. Um, the key areas of activity uh, for adjudication before this CCB are consent, capacity, civil committal, and substitute decision making. So well over the majority, 80% um, of the applications involve a person's involuntary status to a psychiatric facility or a review of the Healthcare Consent Act provisions concerning a person's capacity to consent or refuse treatment. Uh, it also hears applications from healthcare professionals in respect of substitute decision making. I'm going to uh, just talk a little bit about the legal retainer. We're really fortunate to have uh, across Canada uh, participants, so we don't want to sound like we're too overly Ontario centric, but uh, we don't know anything about anything outside of Ontario. I don't anyway, so I got to stay focused. But it seems to me that the starting point on the legislative scheme, and there's a lot of law legislation that we have to consider in Ontario anyway, but the key is 
is our capacity legislation through the SDA, the Substitute Decisions Act, and the key is, I think, the mental health legislation through the Mental uh, Health Act. And those two cornerstones are across Canada. We have the similar kinds of legislation, almost capacity legislation and mental health legislation. So I think a lot of what we're talking about uh, is that we need to, it seems to me, I like to go to those as my starting points because what is my capacity legislation say and then if what we might call a more urgent circumstance with the mental health uh, legislation. So let's start with the legal retainer in that context. And that is, instead of, uh, uh, the, the, the concern of course is, is that we wanna look at capacity and the criteria and the considerations for uh, the retainer with counsel uh, and starting with capacity to instruct. And I know, Kim, you and I get into uh, the various ranges of capacity and the types of capacity, so to speak. The, you've already described the different variety of capacity that needs to be considered. And truthfully, the starting point is capacity to instruct counsel. And I will often, we have to understand the context, we have to make sure the client knows the known choices and appreciates the consequences as the slide identifies, but it is both financial and legal considerations that need to be, to, to be addressed. And so when we do this, the first line of, uh, of attack, of course, is our retainer and sitting across the table with the client and getting uh, assessing that in the context of these sort of basic uh, parameters. But I will also, from time to time, and I'm sure, Kim, I'm, you, you must do it too from time to time, is I will get a, a capacity assessment on my client's ability to construct. Uh, we, we don't want to get into a starting point with a legal retainer where if it is in a gray zone and we're not satisfied after we've done our own uh, inquiry and we'll talk a little bit about the nature of that inquiry, we don't want to get into this initial retainer without comfort. And I, I don't know if you had over the years done the capacity to assess counsel, I mean instruct counsel yeah. opinions? I mean it's hard. You've you got to look at each situation uh, differently. Obviously these retainers they take more time and you're, you, you meet with the clients a few times and then you, you may identify issues. Um, often I find you that uh, most clients will say, unless they are trying to protect an estate plan that they feel is vulnerable, will often say that they're, they really don't want to, do, to undergo a capacity mm -hmm. assessment and obviously we respect that. But um, uh, it, it, sometimes you want it for comfort, mm -hmm. um, but it's a, uh, Every client is different. It's a tough t conversation. I just had one client this weekend where I uh, was doing a will, and I, I didn't really think we needed the capacity assessment. I just thought, though, on, the, on balance, I wanted to get it, uh, the, the extra protection. And I said to my client, look, this is why, and it's going to help you. It's, it's all good. And uh, it, it, it was very fun because he, he's like, you know, I did it. I passed, and he passed the test, of course. And he says, you know what? Those tests are for young people. I don't like going through that. And it's true. Even a person who has strong cognition at that age and stage, he's in his late 80s, he's like, I don't want to do this. Nobody likes being asked to count backwards from 100. Mm -hmm. So I don't go into the instruct, capacity to instruct level of assessments every time. But we, as lawyers, we've got these sort of three parameters to start the process. And the next element of uh, capacity is capacity to contract. And that's, again, we go to our capacity legislation in Ontario, Section 2. You've got to be 18. You're presumed, as Kim says, to have capacity, but you're also presumed to be capable to enter into a contract. But here's the, the underlying elements of it and the types of inquiries as a lawyer we can take when we undertake this kind of inquiry is you know, understanding the nature of the contract and understanding the effect of the contract and the circumstances. So that's been developed in the law and there's a case called Bank of Nova Scotia versus Kelly in 1973 that started to sort of set these parameters. But there, here we are starting to drill down on the nature of our retainer. Can they instruct? Can they enter into a retainer, i.e. a contract? And if I'm building into this uh, comfort zone, then I'm going to start to look at questions of what is the nature of the retainer and what kind of capacity am I looking for. So for example, Section 8 of the Substitute Decisions Act deals with capacity to grant and revoke uh, continuing powers of attorney for property. The Act in Ontario is such a great Act in so many respects, and sometimes it's a frustrating Act, but in the respect of giving us some parameters for testing, I, I think it's pretty cool. Like They give a bit of a codification. And so when I go to my experts, but when I go to myself and I want to make these inquiries as to whether or not they've got this capacity even at the preliminary stage, I'll go to the Act and I'll pull out Section 8 and look at the nature of the kinds of expectations that the Substitute Decisions Act requires 
It's intuitive, but it also demonstrates to me how I can ask questions around those parameters. And then I feel like I'm taking, we're gonna, you know, obviously taking careful notes and all of the sorts of things we'll talk about, but I do feel like I'm covering myself, but I also feel comfortable, like it's like anything, it's kind of your checklist, and it's a capacity checklist. Um, and so it's a good starting point and one that I've, I've found, you know, helpful. Again, section six, capacity to manage property, codification there, understanding the relevant information and appreciating the foreseeable consequences, those kinds of tests. They are all intuitively draw out questions for your client that you can get some fulsome answers out of and you can dive in deeper. And, and Hillary Laidlaw years ago came up with this great saying, you probe and verify. When you're seeking capacity of your client, you're probing and verifying the nature and extent of their cognition. And these kinds of parameters are set out in our act anyway, give us a great starting point to start drilling down on the nature and extent of what we think are, uh, are strong, is strong evidence to demonstrate capacity. So uh, capacity to manage property, again, as I say, I go to the act and it speaks for itself. Uh, there are capacity to manage property. Oops, sorry, I hit the wrong page. Oh yeah, oh, yeah good. So I'm um, two ways of deeming incapable. Okay, so this is where we find when we've got someone who's incapable and how do we deal with that? And number one, I talked about mental health act. That's an assessment by the attending physician and you're deemed to be incapable. But secondly, by an authorized capacity assessor. And that uh, capacity assessor, we'll get into some more of the details of what that person involves or doesn't involve. But we've done our first due diligence as a lawyer and then we're gonna start drilling down with the help of an expert or someone who is qualified to, to, to make these assessments. So those are the sort of the starting points on the question of whether someone is incapable. Uh, a lot of times, and I think both our practices cross over this a lot, capacity to gift is a big question. And uh, lots of times we get that early on in the retainer and questions on the planning side. As, as we note in the, in the uh, slide, of course, we're gonna look for the uh, size and nature of the gift uh, and the ability to understand the nature and effect of the disposition of making a will helps uh, understand whether or not the, the threshold is there to understand the extent of the property being in question, to understand the claims of the persons that are being uh, expected to benefit from. That's the classic test metric capacity test. And I use it all the time. No one understand the nature and effect of your dispositions and those who would properly enjoy the bounty of your estate. Like those parameters give me natural questions to ask the client and to drill down on, on the question of capacity. So um, uh, I think that's, uh, oh, I got a little bit of this. Now we're transitioning into the lawyer's role, but let's not go there yet, Kim. Let's yeah, go, yeah, we're gonna turn on. the slide back. I, I find more and more in, in my practice often these disputes that are coming are gifts and whether it be through power, power of attorney the gifts are executed at a time when a, a power of attorney is in force or 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 afterwards gifting is the hot topic these days in my office i think i agree with you and i think it's a, it's really i mean it's important to me i i look at a gift is um uh, you know, the, the threshold to meet the gift standard, what, what surprises me in the litigation side is, is that we don't see more of our deeds of gift. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a hardly ever. Yeah. And, and I have a case now where I've got like 20 deeds of gift and I just want to hug the client. I'm like, you're the best, you know, right. I'm so glad. But, you know, that's an easy solicitor tool that isn't being used enough in my view. But it's easy for us to say, because I, look, my, most of my practice is on the litigation side, so I'm not here to sort of say this is how you got to do it. But it always surprises me that the deed of gift doesn't get used more often. Right. Okay, so just transitioning into the lawyer's role and capacity. And uh, what is our role? We're not doctors. Uh, as Justice Cullity said in the Cousins, Scott and Cousins to say, decision though, we are to play God as either. And we are not to be making determinations on capacity or not capacity necessarily. We are there to, in, to, to in, take the, do the intake and make our own assessment. But as he says, we're not to, here to make the final determination. That's up for a judge and that's what they're, uh, they're there for. So um, let's talk a little bit of the obligations of the, the interview and that initial stage of a lawyer uh, to determine whether or not your client has, as it, the slide says, a requisite legal or decision era, decisional capacity for the task at hand. So um, I think, uh, I, I don't wanna get, use Cullity all day, but it's hard not to. He's, he's spoken about this so, so strongly in Banton and Banton. He's talked about, um, 
uh, this in uh, Scott and Cousins. Uh, and Banton and Banton, he has this great quote, you need a high degree of professionalism may be required in a borderline case where it's possible that the client's wishes may conflict with his or his, his or her best interests and counsel's duty to the court. So what do we do with these gray area clients who are doing things that may not make sense in some ways to us? We have to be not morally judgmental, but we also have to be uh, cognizant of the fact that we're here, uh, there for the advice of the client. So um, I think that's where I stop, and I'm going to I'm cutting into your section. So why don't we over to you, Kim? Okay. So let's delve into uh, a few of the cases that have come to light recently, and there some of them are atypical because they're disciplinary cases, uh, but there's a few that are notable, and uh, the comments by the judiciary. Uh, are also notable. So the first is the Law Society of Upper Canada, which is obviously now the Law Society of Upper Tan uh, of Ontario, sorry, and Ferrant. This was a disciplinary hearing for a lawyer who had represented a vulnerable person who was eventually assessed as incapable of defending himself from exploitation. In the joint submissions before the Law Society, the lawyer admitted to charging unreasonable fees. Uh, to breaching a court order and to misleading the client. And the panel held that, that the facts admitted by the lawyer raised matters which lie at the very heart of a lawyer's obligations. The calling of the lawyer is to protect the client. The calling is the highest where the client is vulnerable. Just as Cullity said, Justice Cullity said in Banton, uh, these matters require a very high degree of professionalism. So the, the Law Society found that Mr. Frant failed in this calling, and the lawyer ended up receiving, receiving a 14-month suspension due to mitigating factors. And another case was out of Alberta, and this is called Re Kozak. It's a recent case, and it deals with um, undue influence in the, uh, in the majority. Uh, the older adult, Ted, met a lady, Marianne. He was very smitten with her. They met at a gun show. Uh, he sold his farm that had been in his family for uh, more than a century. And he bought a new house for Marianne to stay. Um, he was head over heels. He proposed. The wedding was put off. He was put into care. In the meantime, uh, Marianne gambled away uh, the majority of his savings. So the court eventually held that Ted's last will was invalid as a result of the undue influence. And the court comment commented that the difficulties facing lawyers where there may be a hidden narrative of undue influence is, um, is, is an important one. So the court says, unless there were obvious signs that something was amiss, as there was not in this case, the lawyer is not in a position to go beyond the capacity examination to test the information the client brings. The lawyer doesn't know how it is or even why it is that the client has adopted the understanding that produces the instructions. The lawyer doesn't know and can't know what influences have been working on the client. Those influences may be operative, hard at work, while the meeting progresses. And a third party who has controlled and manipulated a client can continue that control and manipulation of the client even though that person isn't physically present. And I think, Ian, we see this a lot in our cases, um, especially it, I think it, it manifests more so in a mediation situation where you can see the influences at play sometimes. Um, so that's interesting that the judge uh, provided that narrative in this case because, uh, as Ian said, um, you know, the court wants to make sure that the lawyer has dis discharged their duty properly. And uh, we, of course, are saying that you have to be probative in your questions. But in this case, uh, the court has really said, how can we possibly know everything that's happening behind the scenes? I think it's important to be live to the issues, but I think that's right. We can't possibly know everything that is happening behind the scenes. And the uh, final case I want to make mention of is Wallman and Wallman Estate. In, in this case, the deceased Murray, he had married his second wife, Estelle. Uh, he ended up disinheriting his two sons that he was close with. He went to a lawyer with Estelle, and that lawyer wanted to do uh, have a capacity assessment done. And uh, Murray declined, and Murray and Estelle went to another lawyer who uh, did the will. And the court held that Murray did lack the requisite testamentary capacity. 
he did, it was held that, the, uh, that Murray was unduly influenced in drafting the, the latter wills. And the drafting solicitor, the court noted, did many things right, including with Murray alone, um, keeping notes, asking Murray questions about the assets. But the court held in the circumstances, the lawyer had an obligation to go further, to address the substantial wealth transfers that were being given to Estelle, the disinheritance of his two sons, his health issues, what his capacity was, if there was undue influence. And so we see that lawyers can get into trouble, either advertently or inadvertently, where these issues come, come into play. And yes, we've got the rules of professional conduct to look to, we've got statutes to look at, we've got the common law, uh, but ultimately a lawyer has to satisfy uh, him or herself that the client has the capacity to give instructions. And I think go further to then be prepared to defend mm -hmm. the position taken at the end of the day. Yeah, I, I, you know, sometimes I'll use as illustrations when I've got a client who I want to make sure, I'm, you know, they're cutting a kid, child out of the will or something. I just sort of, I give the rough numbers. I say, okay, so this is what's going to happen here. You know, there's, if there's $5 million here and you're going to cut your son out, this is who's going to get what. And, and I make a note of it and I sometimes use it as a visual, like I get right into sort of the real granular impact of what you're doing and what the numbers are. So that I can say, look, they understood, I had full retainer, they understood, uh, they had cognitive ability to understand numbers and, and, and analysis on the numbers, and then I showed them the numbers to what, how this was going to impact on the remaining children and on the child that gets written out. And that's the sort of stuff that the cases are talking about. When you get into a situation where you know that you're going to be under scrutiny, it's, it's probe, verify, just demonstrate. Uh, articulate it cleanly in, in terms of plain English and, dr and driving into the tough questions and uh, you know like the tough questions and undue influence you know are you do you feel Jimmy's influencing you has he ever threatened you like tough questions to the client so that you've got a note of it and the clients addressed it right um, so we're gonna get into some best practices and some red flags later but uh, you just want to make sure your notes are thorough um, uh, carefully record them, preserve them, uh, make sure that um, you record the client's answers to these probing questions as they're given. Don't edit them to make them uh, seem, you know, more than what they are. Make sure you, you record things accurately. Um, and, well, I, uh, in addition to probing, you want to make sure that uh, um, there is some verification. And you can look to the client's obviously for that verification, to have them bring in vouchers and bank statements and you know, the recent statement of their GICs. You want to make sure that you, you can verify uh, internally. So lawyers ought to exercise additional caution where there's a third party who may benefit, who is bringing the person to the, to the lawyer's meeting, um, and obviously developing your own internal checklist to go through uh, I think is of great assistance. I certainly use checklists that, that, that we've done internally uh, when I meet with clients uh, uh, for capacity um, and undue influence. So um, the rules of professional conduct, Ian's going to speak to now, um, they do give us some guidance. So I think that there, I mean, Kim mentioned that case that uh, was a, a law society comp uh, uh, hearing decision. Uh, what, what it does, it reminds me anyway, is, is that the rules of professional conduct are a good starting point in many respects to demonstrating that, again, I, I just keep coming back to, if I can get a series of parameters to work from, i.e. the Substitute Decisions Act kind of parameters, the kind of parameters the rules of conduct take you to, then I, you know, at some point you, we're, we're all well trained to ask questions and so the questions will come naturally. So I look at the rules of conduct and professional conduct and I see, um, oh that's too soon, uh, I'm going to leave that screen there. Uh, I see rule 3.2-9 uh, talks about the fact that a lawyer must, as far as reasonably possible, maintain normal lawyer-client relationships. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means that we want to investigate the, to the nature that Kim's talking about and that the court, I mean, that the hearing tribunals are going to expect us to do that. Um, is, is this person, you know, the right, uh, are they, the, the nature of the instructions you're getting um, uh, such that they need further inquiry? And, and a client uh, uh, rule 3.2, uh, 
uh, what's this, 3.29, when a client's ability as far as is reasonably possible to maintain a normal client relationship. That's not, those are, those are harsh words in a sense for lawyers because we are trying to maintain the relationship with someone who may be in a diminished capacity range. And like I talked about my client earlier, he, he wasn't crazy about doing a capacity assessment. He didn't like the idea. And that put some strain on our relationship. So I had to explain to him why in this circumstance it was worth doing. Uh, but that, that being said, we've obviously got 3.3-1, uh, the confidentiality of expectations and requirements. Uh, that's important because that kind of information can leak out when you're dealing with family members or, or uh, you know, getting assistance from people around the, uh, the, the individual who is in maybe a, a weaker or diminished capacity scenario. Uh, you know, we want to make sure that we don't divulge any of the information uh, and that duty is, is central. Uh, this is the heavy one, and this is the one that 3.71, but we all, all across Canada have our own rules of conduct, but they're all sort of mirror this sort of these parameters. You know, a lawyer shall not withdraw from representation from the client except for good and reasonable uh, notice to the client. Well, you know, withdrawal is not the easiest, uh, uh, coming back to our rule, um, initial rule that we want to keep and maintain a normal relationship. Boy, when you get to the point of withdrawal for, as a consequence of issues relating to capacity, you are really into a pretty intense uh, relationship uh, problem. And um, uh, it's one of those situations where, again, we come back to the colored words. We can't play God. If our client is giving us instructions and we've gone through the sorts of things we've talked about, assessments or assess them, inquired, made our own notes and, and verified, you know, withdrawing for, for purposes of reasons of lack of capacity are, um, it's, it's one of those uh, law school questions. It really depends on the facts. Mm -hmm. But it's there, and, it's, and, and, and we're restricted from walking away from, obviously, quite properly walking away from clients without uh, due regard. Uh, I find some of those situations even more difficult, Ian. Well, you've acted for a client for a while. Uh, you've always been confident that you've had capable instructions. You're proceeding through a, a court proceeding, and then you start to get instructions which don't make sense anymore. And then you find that, in fact, the client isn't retaining the information, that they're not understanding the transaction anymore. And, and then all of a sudden, you, 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 you're kind of stuck. What do you do? Yeah. And, you know, approaching that with the client then so far into a retainer to say, you know, I'm really concerned about the instructions I'm getting or I'm not getting. Um, you know, would you consider having a capacity assessment? Getting over that hurdle is hard enough in itself, but then um, supposed, supposedly you have the client does, it is found that the client doesn't have the requisite capacity to continue with the retainer. Then what do you do, especially if there is no power of attorney, there's no guardianship, there's, um, you know, I've had that situation a couple of times over the past two years, and uh, in each case we handled it differently, but they're really tough. You know, it is tough, and when, my, and when I get into a litigation retainer, one of the, always in my first meeting, I say to the client, do you have a will and power of attorney? And I say, because you're gonna, you may need help, and not that you're, you know, they could be young, and, but they could get hit by a bus and be needing it. Uh, to whatever extent I can do to sort of get away from that rabbit hole of scenarios that you're talking about, you want it, I'd like to try to do, but you, you don't have full control of that. The clients say all the time, yeah, my wills and powers of attorney up to date, and then you find out they're nowhere close. Yeah. So, and that's fine, it's life in the big city, but I mean, it's interesting, the rules of conduct don't really help us because at the end of the day, it's for good, the, the words it says is the client you can be withdrawing for, you have to withdraw for good cause. Well, what does that mean? And that's not very helpful. And, uh, and I, I get why they have to put it in that parameter because it's got to be a broad language and it can't be definitive as to when you can or can't withdraw. But it's exactly your scenario when the client is, is losing grip of their own world and their own sphere. And, and certainly I'm, uh, I, I sympathize with you. I certainly go through them and I've got one currently that, that stresses me out. And it's, uh, you know, I'm not, never quite sure. And then of course you, you come back to the same relationship problems got a client who can't give you instructions anymore mm -hmm. yet other parties are moving forward with the forward with the litigation and you have to protect your client but you have no ability to protect them and it's difficult well a good trick in Toronto is just go ask for a court date 
they're so they're so far out that uh, it gives you time to figure out what to do next. But uh, all kidding aside, you really do have a a, a, a management issue that, uh, to the extent that you can predict, is always worth trying to predict and trying to get it uh, keep. In one of those scenarios, I was able to. Um, the client admitted that you know she needed help, and I and I got a Section 16 assessment. So the PGT ended up acting as a statutory guardian, and so that was in the end an an easy fix for the mm -hmm. client. Um, but it was still a very difficult, complex set of facts to go through. Yeah, as I say, coming back to the client and asking them to count backwards from 100 is never a pleasant discussion. Um, okay, so capacity assessments, they are. Oh, maybe I've got the wrong notes here. What have I got? I'm supposed to be at capacity assessments, right? Am I passing to, wait a minute, uh, page 31. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to talk about capacity assessments now, right? And uh, what's that? Oh, rule five. Oh, cool. Okay, rule five. When acting as, ac as an advocate, a lawyer shall represent honorably, fairness and courtesy and respect. That's a given and it's um, particularly a... Uh, Broad and unhealthy. Right? I know it's 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 like that. It, like that is a great drafting, eh? How how perfect is that? There's if we don't do Candor, that. Candor, fairness, courtesy, <laughs> respect. I never get that from you. <laughs> I think we should put that on our wall. Uh, okay, capacity assessment. So, I just I think really from that standpoint, let's just start at first principles on the capacity assessment. I talked about when I use them in my experience and when I don't and some of those thoughts, but a capacity assessment is, in Ontario, the Attorney General's got a list, uh, uh, the Substantive Decision Act sets out some of the requirements of who can be a capacity assessor. These are uh, a real, a really useful tool uh, to, to seek out in the right circumstances, and, and obviously the, the, the report itself is subject to criticism and the litigation. If someone could say, nice try, that capacity assessment isn't worth a darn, uh, but it's a, uh, it's a third party, medically based ish uh, assessment of capacity beyond what we can do. And we really are charged with at the front lines as lawyers to assess capacity in every practice area. But, you know, the truth is at the, at the end of the day, it's always nice to get someone else to, to get a second look at it who's got the medical training and the, and the cognitive training. So the capacity assessments are phenomenal tools. And I guess really um, one of the things that uh, uh, I always think about when I'm doing my capacity assessment is uh, who am I going to use and how best to use it. Uh, some of the best practices, of course, is uh, vital that we've met with our client, made sure that this is uh, the right thing to do and that the client understands the right to refuse it. But, you know, what do we go to an expert? Do we go to a medical expert? Do we go to a psychiatrist? Do we go to someone who's got more what I would call touchy feely skills? Uh, who can really make the client feel more comfortable, uh, who's got some social work background and those sorts of things that are, that are not always there with the medical profession, uh, to be fair. So, uh, you know, I think it's a question of when and who is really, that's the tough thing. And I'm sure you must run into this all the time. I mean, you, know, you know, who to use for a capacity assessment can uh, drive, not the result, who cares, the result's going to be whatever the result is, but can drive a process that, again, coming back to client management and respect for the client and, and so on. Uh, what, what person do you want to put in front of that person to, what assessor do you want to put in front of that client to make the capacity assessment itself? Yeah. I, <clears throat> the factors that go into that are, are difficult because, first of all, if it's a litigation matter, you're probably going to go with an expert. If it's, <clears throat> if it's a, a matter that you can think that you think can get resolved outside of litigation, maybe you go a different route. And there's a, you know, a huge discrepancy in the cost of these assessments, the qualifications. Um, you always have to make sure that you're giving the assessor the legal tests that you're asking to be performed uh, and make sure that they are informed about that legal test, which I find difficult at times because y you think they know, but they don't really know. Mm -hmm. And then the information that goes to that assessor and who gives the information can make or break an assessment. Absolutely. And all of that is subject to cross-examination, a trial, and so on. And so you, you really, uh, you know, you don't want to rush into it. You want to make sure that the client's comfortable, but that you're setting up a record that makes sense. Uh, but as I say, an important tool. Uh, 
attorneys and guardians. Well, so let's talk a little bit about what that is all about. And under the, the Ontario legislation, of course, uh, we've got uh, a power of attorney uh, itself is the, uh, I would say, the preferred tool. Uh, Arthur Fish used to describe a power of attorney as, a, as the cheapest piece of insurance you can buy. Uh, for the, to the extent that you got a backup to your uh, resources and assets uh, without, uh, without concern. And, um, and you know, uh, to say that though, we've got to make sure that uh, we've, got to, we've made the right choice. And the choice of the power of attorney, you and I are on the litigation side more often than not, but that is obviously a fundamental element of any successful power of attorney. You've got to have capacity, they've got to understand the document, all of those sorts of fundamentals on the capacity side, but it's the choice of attorney that can tend to draw out the biggest problems. Um, so uh, the tool itself, it's, um, uh, there's two real elements to it. One is, of course, the idea that the power of attorney for property uh, takes effect immediately upon execution, and the other is what we call a springing power of attorney with a triggering provision. Uh, I, most of the powers of attorney I see and actually do with, for clients is, is effective at date of execution. I don't know what, what your sort of data would be. What would you, what are the most ones that you would see? Uh, date, date of, of execu execution. Okay. Yeah. So I think a spring power of attorney in and of itself brings out possible fights. Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, the ones that I have seen, not all of them, but the ones that I've seen, of course, we get into is because it's being litigated over, whether it should be sprung. And, and the test that's in the power of attorney document itself may not be clear enough or we got to get two doctors and then one of the doctors isn't, the report is a bit weak and all of a sudden we're into a debate. And uh, I always say when my clients are signing power of attorney, you're in, you sign a blank check, you better trust the person. And the second part of that is, is, is vital in all of this is, is that what uh, are your duties of a power of attorney? And I think uh, well, like your thoughts on this, Kim, like it seems to me one of the easiest ways to prevent power of attorney fights is that people, when they sign their power of attorney, they actually tell the attorney what their job is. And so I will often give in my report, here's the job, hand it to your attorney when you think it should be done, and, and it sets out all the duties to account and all the sort of fiduciary duties that, that you know, are here. I mean, they're, they're, some of them are pretty obvious, but a lot of clients don't even know that record keeping is important. And, and do you, like, what, what's your view, I mean, in terms of how we can somehow prevent these fights to our clients at that early stage? I think, well, I'm not a drafting lawyer, so I know you do some drafting at your office, Ian, we don't. So I don't usually have the opportunity to, to say to a client, look, you know, give this information sheet or this checklist or send your attorney for, for some professional um, consultation. Um, but I think the, the biggest problem is this uh, not knowing or just simply ignoring the duty to account. And that's where all the trouble comes into, into play. Yeah, I, I think hands down it's the biggest. Sometimes the self-dealing uh, element of attorneyship is uh, the other kind of area where you and I can pounce on in a litigation environment. I always find that self-dealing obligations a little bit tough to manage because if you're looking after your, uh, your, your mom as a power of attorney but you're not acting on it in any way, there's an argument that even if you take any benefit during that period, once the power of attorney signed, that you're putting yourself at risk of criticism. Sure. And I've always thought that was too high of a, a test. I think the case is there's some mixed authority, as you know, in terms of whether you have the obligation to account from the date of the signing of the power of attorney or the obligation to account from the date of the activating the power of attorney. Yeah. But what happens in that gray area of, you know, say a kid is totally, uh, fine, nothing's going on, but the father says, you know what, Jimmy, I've always thought that you should have my fancy boat. And he gives the boat, no deed of gift, and he's a power of attorney. And sometimes you see in the litigation, they start to say, well, that's a self-dealing transaction. And you're like, come on, how do we, he wasn't even acting as power of attorney. Mm -hmm. But it's an argument that's there, and it's, uh, it's available yeah. to be criticized. Yeah, and those are tough disputes to help resolve and in, in increasing disputes. Absolutely. Um, and then I guess the other thing is, uh, you know, the duty to account and some of the things you can't do, you must account. Uh, you, one of the things I always find interesting is uh, that this idea that you uh, uh, can't delegate. And then let's uh, maybe talk about that for a minute and then I'll let you go on to your section because um, 
this delegation piece is really important. I mean, there's a difference between a fiduciary and delegating a fiduciary duty and delegating an agent duty. And, and the idea that, you know, a fiduciary has to make the decision, the agent can do the steps. And I think you must see this all the time in litigation where someone isn't really making the differentiation very clear and they're actually getting outside of their authority to delegate. Uh, do you see a lot of that? that yeah, of that? for sure. Actually, it's a really interesting clause in a power of attorney recently which permitted, now of course it's not in the legislation, but sought to permit an attorney to appoint a new attorney. Hmm. So not an alternative appointment, yeah. alternative appointment, but the ability at some point to appoint another attorney. What wow. do you think of that? I like that. That's cool. I mean, that's you that's in a bit. I think it's totally bunk, but it's cool. <laughs> like, it, it, I think it's innovative, and it's, the thing is, is that when well, we're coming into this now, we've seen this with the secondary wills dispute that's out there and uh, some of the recent decisions. I mean, to the extent of the court that's going to jump in when there's a broad exercise of discretion that it isn't clearly identified and and that it gives a special uh, sort of a need to make an expanded power of uh, authority um, I think those things are the things that are going to get tested and that I mean it seems to me uh, just intuitively that doesn't seem to make sense that you're allowed to do that but right. then again you know what we're seeing a lot of uh, mixed authorities out there and uh, mercifully uh, we you and I get to fight over them on either side doesn't matter to me uh, Banton and Banton, of course, talks a little bit about the, uh, the elements of it. That decision, of course, is, is a tremendous importance to the whole question of uh, fiduciary duties. But let's turn to the whole area of ILA. And uh, I know you've written a ton on this recently, and uh, we'll pass the uh, mic over to you. Okay, so, so just a bit on this. It's important, obviously, to consider if it's appropriate or whether or not it's in a situation you should require independent legal advice. Um, for example, if you had a conflict of interest that arose in your joint retainer or when engaging in certain types of transactions, real property transactions or discovering an error or omission, um, Another more relevant or a scenario we see more often is where an elderly parent owns a house and that adult child who seeks to use that house as security, for example, for a business loan uh, from a financial institution. And this happens more often uh, than one would think. And the parent in that case arguably ought to get ILA. It's not necessary in every situation, and our cases um, speak to that. It's fact specific, um, and but a lawyer who agrees to provide ILA must must really consider whether or not they they want the job because I think it's a, a high threshold that you have to meet. The duty of care, especially in certain demographics, uh, requires, as Justice Kelly said, a high degree of professionalism but integrity as well. So providing legal advice in a limited scope retainer. Um, with a client that perhaps you're meeting for the first time, you don't know a lot about the client, you don't have a lot of background information, um, there have been a history, a long history of proceedings maybe up until that point in time, the client is uh, possibly vulnerable or dependent or under some sort of disability. The standard that we know for providing proper ILA has been generally discussed in a number of decisions and that's the Goodman and Geffen decision and the uh, Inch Naraya and Sheikh uh, and Tulik cases. Importantly for lawyers, the, the Inch decision, uh, this is a case where an elderly woman gave her a rather substantial gift to her nephew of almost the entire value of her property, leaving next to nothing for, um, for herself, for her own support. And in this case, it was alleged that the nephew had unduly influenced the woman and that the gift should fail. The, e the legal issue uh, that became prevalent before the court was whether the presumption of undue influence was rebutted by the independent legal advice that was given. In other words, was that ILA adequate? And the case in Inch is the authority for the proposition that in providing ILA, a lawyer must not only explain the nature and effect of the contract or the guarantee or the transaction or the agreement, but also have a broader understanding of the client's assets, the risk to the client in the transaction, and any alternative for accomplishing the transaction without risk. So I think that's a high threshold. Um, 
And obviously from our Supreme Court of Canada, um, we know that ILA is, 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 is important because uh, it demonstrates that a person understands the transaction and that the person has entered into the transaction freely and voluntarily. And this raises the importance of the interplay of capacity in ILA. And it's usually the best evidence to prove free will. Um, it's not always, but it is the best evidence. Um, and also, notably, our courts have said it's not for the ILA lawyer to approve of the transaction if the ILA client understands the nature and effect of the transaction. So the, the key is that the transaction was freely chosen to be entered into. And in Coomer and Coomer, the court said it's for the adult persons of competent mind to decide whether they will do an act. And I do, I do not think, this is the judge speaking, that independent and competent advice means independent and competent approval. It simply means that the advice shall be removed entirely from the suspected atmosphere and that from the clear language of an independent mind, they should know precisely what they're doing. And we also have some great guidance from the uh, British Columbia Law Society. Um, and they say, when giving independent legal advice, it's important to go much further in explaining the legal aspects. So you have to consider the client's capacity, um, communication, can the, can the client freely communicate, are there language barriers? Uh, to meet the standard of a reasonably comp competent lawyer, it's obviously trite to say that, uh, uh, that uh, capacity to enter into the transaction should be present. But um, these are things that a lawyer has to turn their mind to um, and to turn their mind to whether or not the ILA is uh, appropriate from the outset. So in that regard, we uh, have a few solicitor's negligence cases. The first is Gammon and Steve's. And in that case, an elderly couple in their 80s uh, conveyed their home to their niece and her husband and some other miscellaneous items of furniture and a vehicle. Later, the couple brought an action to have all of the items returned to them. And the trial judge found that there was a failure on the part of the lawyer to explain the true nature of the transaction to the elderly couple. Uh, the lawyer, the judge comments, the lawyer smoked and drank coffee and spent 45 minutes having general conversation, but never spoke to the couple alone, not once. And we see this time and time again in our files in our office where it, it just astounds me that the lawyer hasn't spoken to the actual client alone. The court noted that the lawyers have to take sufficient steps to permit themselves to satisfy a court that a grantor was fully aware of the circumstances and consequences of the act and that there was no undue influence. In this decision, the transaction was set aside and it went to appeal and it was upheld on appeal. In another case, Scott and Clancy, this involved the transfer of land by Mr. Wilbert to his neighbors. The lawyer who gave the ILA advised Wilbert that he could get more money for his land if he proceeded to give him his King Lear warning on how he gave his kingdom away and then he was thrown out. And Wilbert told the lawyer that the neighbors had been uh, good to him and he wanted to leave his land to them. So um, the transaction happened um, and the court concluded that the lawyer's advice fell short of meeting the standards set out in the inch uh, case and the uh, Goodman and Geffen and Tulick cases. And the court went on to find that despite there was a deficiency in the ILA, it was nonetheless adequate in having the client understand the nature and the terms of the agreement and that he was acting of his own free volition. So that's All ILA. Right. So that's great. So we, we want to talk a little bit about red flags and best practices, but maybe, what do you think if we can, we should maybe round out the end of this with that, uh, just because we give people something to look forward to and maybe deal with a few questions. Uh, uh, at this point, we have a great question about um, the, uh, the whole issue of uh, uh, capacity assessments and the choice of assessors. And Kim, do you have a preference in terms of the choice of assessors and, 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 and their background and sort of what, what are your, uh, when, when you're getting into capacity assessment uh, scenarios, uh, what do you prefer? The doctors, the social workers, the, what, what, what sort of realm of uh, practice areas? It depends on the case. It also depends on the means of the client. If I know for sure it's going to litigation and the question is going to turn on capacity, then I'm going to want a doctor and uh, 
likely a geriatrician. Um, but uh, I think it depends on the circumstances. You know, and I think it's a bit of an access to justice issue in some ways because it is so dependent financially. It's a, it's a, big, it's a big nut to get uh, one of these experts. There's only probably a handful, certainly less than six in this whole country who do that sort of pure work as, at the psychiatric, geriatric level. And it's so, private. It's pro that's right. And so you've got to get them. And then most of the time when you're getting the situations, you actually have to have them go see the client. So then again, there's more expense. So, you know, these reports can get into the thousands of dollars. So it's sure. not uh, easily. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and so I, I do get a little worried that uh, the courts, as you were, you know, when we and we do, we assess what the courts want us to do. And they have this fairly high standard. In fact, sometimes ridiculously high in my view in some of the cases in terms of what the solicitor is supposed to do yeah. but you're across the table with someone who's got modest assets and you say to them by the way I want you to set aside five grand to get a capacity assessment by so and so and that may not even get the whole thing done um, I'm not sure that that's uh, the right way to have our you know our assessments uh, articulated either and so my view is truthfully I mean we've got, I've got a I, I've used a variety over the years and I don't, uh, I have to, as you say, you have to look at the circumstances, then you have to turn around and say, well, what are the realistic resources and time and allocation that you're going to put to right, this? Right. Uh, ultimately, the biggest sales pitch I say to my clients is, look, at the end of the day, I'm going to make good notes. I'm going to make my assessment. I'm going to use the kind of checklist that I've talked about to determine your capacity. But who am I? I'm only a lawyer. Mm -hmm. It would be nice to get some sort of medical uh, assessment thrown into the mix, and it's your call, and it's at your risk And if you don't do it. So... You know, some clients say don't bother, and I make a careful note of that, and some clients say I've got to have it done. It'd be great if we could take, not that we want to become qualified assessors, that we could take that course, but of course as lawyers we can't take that course that the ministry offers. I wish if I, you know, had a wish list, and I, and I know that the Law Commission spoke to this in a recent report, that there was more consistency in the direction that assessors had to, or the approach that they had to take. Um, and in that way, you might get reports that, that are, you know, they conform in some way and you know what, what the yeah. job is that has to be done and that is in effect done. Because so many um, lawyers or assessors take different approaches to the assessment. Um, some only like to talk to the individual whose capacity is being assessed, but others will get information from maybe the predator in mm -hmm. in this scenario and and that's difficult because then it you know there was no direction given to the assessor and then the assessment is is not it's easily easily set aside and so i wish there was some consistency yeah sort of a template that we could say here are the parameters uh well that's something maybe to work on and we'll craft something but uh we'll leave that for another day uh another question that's uh that's come up is just you were re referencing earlier the consent and capacity board and and that role that it plays in uh in capacity assessments uh i've certainly done uh, my share of them over the years and appeared before the board uh, and I know you have, and, and sort of, can you tell us a little bit about your experience with the Consent and Capacity Board? You've told us the nature of what it's there for, but what, what kind of experience have you had in dealing with them over the years? Yeah, I, I haven't been to one in a while, Ian. Um, uh, certainly, it's a less formal process than going to court, but um, also, if you're not doing it on a daily basis, you, you're at a disadvantage if, if you're not up on the, the, on the process and the procedure. Um, uh, I, you know, my experience has, uh, has usually been limited to a challenge of a finding of incapacity. Um, uh, although recently, um, we were consulted about a uh, a move by the medical professionals to um, remove or, shall we say, um, set aside the decision of a substitute decision maker because it was against the medical advice of the professionals. I haven't attended the capacity board yet on that, but, but I think that's an interesting one. Yeah, it's, I find it a fascinating um, uh, venue in the sense that they really do, because they've got lay people on the board, They've got experts, they've got the attending physicians as witnesses. It's a real, I think in some ways, it's a really interesting uh, conglomerate of 
um, of the of the resources available to assess capacity, and because you've got these different perspectives. So, to the extent that uh, it's a it's a different viewpoint on uh, process in terms of assessing capacity. Um, all right, so we have one question uh, to deal with here, and then I've got another one here. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we do have a question from the web, and it's uh, a three-part question. So first off, after being retained, uh, asked the viewer, I obtained a capacity assessment of my client. It found my client was incapable. I elected to appoint a litigation guardian for my client and continue the proceedings via that route, instead of being appointed as a Section 3 counsel. My understanding is that this affords me broader rights as regular counsel with the litigation guardian versus Section 3 counsel. Am I correct? The, can I? Okay. Please. So the litigation guardian role is very different from the Section 3 role. A litigation guardian, uh, so attorneys and guardians appointed by the court are entitled to act as litigation guardians. In other words, um, they are pursuing the litigation or defending the litigation on behalf of the, uh, the person. They're the one making the decisions. Uh, Section 3 counts, so you are entitled to receive instructions or wishes from a client whose capacity is at issue. They may well be incapable. Of course, you have a professional duty apart from that uh, as an officer of the court to, to, I would say, arguably only um, well, to make it clear to the court when you're uh, communicating capable instructions or capable wishes. The point is there is a huge distinction between a litigation guardian and Section 3 counsel. They're, they're, they're not the same thing. Uh, the second part to that yeah, question. Go ahead. Do you have a no, no, it's good. Oh. Yeah, it's good. I'll do it the one off the web after you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, secondly, um, the viewer asks, I assume I need a limited scope retainer for the litigation Guardian, is that correct? Uh, it's hard to answer that question without knowing all of the facts. Yeah. Um, so I can't really assist with that, an answer there. All right, perhaps this third one would be uh, a little easier. Uh, third and final, once a litigation guardian is appointed by the court, is the litigation guardian my new client? Do I take instructions from the guardian? Do I still keep the original client in the loop? I would say that the litigation guardian has the responsibility of keeping the original client in the loop because the litigation guardian is the, um, uh, the person who is now the client. Yeah, I kind of look at the litigation guardian as the active client and, and for sure you've got to take instructions from the litigation guardian. It's, it's, it's compellable, it's, it's compelled in the Substitute Decisions Act and it's the right thing to do to keep the alleged incapable uh, up to date for sure and it's an obligation I think a litigation guardian best to do it. Sometimes I've acted for litigation guardians and they'll say listen can you give me a summary of where we're at and a report that I can go through with the uh, alleged incapable. So, yeah. and I, I just want to add a proviso because I don't know the real circumstances uh, mm -hmm. uh, of the situation uh, but I don't know if you are in a conflict in acting now for the litigation guardian versus the original client that you had, so I can't possibly answer that without knowing more. Yeah, facts drive those litigation guardian appointments so much, and that's like you say, the nature of the retainer and everything, it, it just all depends on the, the scope of what you're involved with, and, uh, and so you don't want to get too deep into it. And sometimes a litigation guardian is appointed, yet there is still an attorney who's making decisions for an incapable person, mm -hmm. or a guardian who's making decisions. And uh, I, yeah, it's hard to say on on what we've been given to to answer the question. Okay, La one last question. Then let's talk about red flags and best practices before we wind up. Uh, Kim, can a power of attorney uh, in Ontario make a will? Can an attorney make a will? No. All right, that's a black and white answer, which is great. All right, so let's just talk a little bit about some of the red flags and be best practices, and maybe you and I can uh, work through this together as we wind this up, because I think we've really uh, covered the cornerstone of corner, four corners of what 
capacity uh, considerations need to be addressed. And then, um, uh, so what? What can we do as lawyers? What can we take away to uh, make sure that we're better lawyers at dealing with questions of capacity? And um, uh, the, uh, the, the list on the, the screen is a good starting point in terms of the kinds of red flags. Uh, you know, sometimes irrational behavior in reality, distortion can be just an eccentric client uh, versus delusions. Mm -hmm. and, um, and certainly over time, uh, it's, uh, I've, I've had that unresponsive uh, and inability to make a decision. Boy, we got lots of clients like that who we wouldn't say are incapable, but they're good red flags to identify uh, from a standpoint of our practice there and, and good takeaways, it seems to me. Uh, are there some other ones that, Kim, that come to mind that you'd like to identify? Uh, and here's our next slide on this. Yeah, I think a big one is isolation and alienation and sequestering. And you find that a lot in these predatory financial abuse situations. Um, so you want to ask and probe who, who are the people in this person's life, in this client's life? Um, you know, and and find out the nature of the relationship. If there's strained ones, if there's family conflict, uh, if there's a support network. Yeah, you know, I think it's it's funny we because we live in a world of expecting the worst and hoping for the best, maybe. But you know, I also don't want to overreact. If we've got familiar circumstances where there are supports around them and their support networks that may, on the face of it, look a little dodgy. Uh, you know, sometimes it really is that person's circumstances that's the best they've got, or that is the dutiful son, as opposed to presuming that this is a, an undue influencer. And so we're good at, uh, you know, you and I have to be uh, sensitive to the idea that we've got to really make sure we explore the possibility of those threats, and then, you know, reference, reference that against the fact that this may be the best resource and support for the client. Who's taking the client to... Uh, to, to all of the uh, medical appointments. And you know, at the end of the day, you want to alienate that over uh, what might be misplaced uh, conspiracy theories that are being sp spun around. It, it's a tough balance. And I, I think that the uh, red flags are, are really there to be red flagged and then assessed. And as uh, I said- And the probing helps you get yeah. down to what's really going on. I, I love this case. And I, I had a client once, she came to me, she was 88 years old, Ian and she, um, she had given a power of attorney to two of her three children and she recently moved into a retirement residence and she said to me she had to sell her house to be able to pay for this private retirement residence. Mm -hmm. uh, she knew the value of her home, she knew what the amount of a rent that was due um, and she knew that her kids were trying to help her sell her house but she said my daughter has been really distant and rude with me lately and I, I think that she has some, she's done something because she told me I don't own my house anymore. Could you check title? So sure enough, we checked title and what, what happened was that the house was transferred into the daughter attorney's name for natural love and affection and she was livid. She'd owned her house for 60 years and she said, I want it back, get me my house back. So we get the house back, but red flag in the room is the other child is there brings her to the meeting. I ask him to leave and I say, so this has happened, we're gonna fix this, but what about your attorneys? Do you, do you think you should do a new power of attorney? And she says, yeah, my, my baby, uh, my baby who was older than me, who is now sitting in my reception could be that person. And I said, you know, what's his circumstances? And we find out that he was recently divorced and she gave him a money order of 200,000 the week before to help him out financially. At the end of the day, you know, she was very clear that, um, you know, there was nobody really left around her. All of her friends were mm -hmm. dying and yeah. she resorted to appointing um, two of her longtime neighbors who were younger than her as her attorneys, which was, uh, I think, resolved the situation. but. As an example, yeah, yeah. it's tough, and it's uh, we can't presume circumstances. So, I think in terms of wrapping up, there's some other uh, on the slides. We went through a couple of other uh, uh, important red flags, but uh, the last thing we want to do is keep people past the appointed hour. So, unless there's any other uh, questions or anything from the uh, 
the web. Uh, Kim, thank you very much for uh, yeah. all of your great comments and uh, over to you to close. Thank you very much. And uh, we have a few other webinars coming up, uh, the details um, of which I have now displaced. Um, we have a, a session coming up on uh, capacity in the real estate lawyer, capacity in the family law lawyer, and capacity in the corporate lawyer. Uh, so we invite you to sign up, and uh, we'll see you then. Thank you.